I actually, Don came into my class, my intro entrepreneurship class, and I see a lot of you guys up here today, and um, I was just blown away by what he said, by the stuff he was saying. And it's pretty cool because I, I follow a lot of entrepreneurs, but Don is actually an entrepreneur in something where you don't see that a lot, and that's politics. So um, really pay attention to this. He, he's an awesome guy, and it's really a great presentation, and I've learned a lot from him, and I'm sure you will as well. So I'll pass it on to Dr. Basu. So my job is to introduce you to Don. Uh, Don came here and did a similar presentation. Um, when was it earlier this year, Don? Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, he caught some, caught some controversy because he made some predictions about elections. And one of the things which he does uh, is to look at the nonverbals of the candidates. And then based on that, he makes, especially the more visible the race uh, it is, the better he does. And then he makes predictions of the outcome of the elections. If you're, figured, if you're trying to figure out how that works, he's going to tell you about it, okay? But uh, his specialty is nonverbal. He applies it in the legal setting, in medical settings. He does it with politics. Uh, and that's what he's going to talk about right now because of the 2012 uh, elections, uh, obviously, next month. He is controversial. Some people did get upset last time he was here. Uh, but, um, you know, you can interact with them. We are not able to usually get somebody with this kind of, uh, I guess, time, timing-wise, having somebody with this stature here. Uh, he is going to be, and I was telling my st uh, students in my other class, I can't pronounce it very well, but uh, he's going to be on the TED Talks uh, Regional next month. And uh, we're going to get him first. So that's why we want what Jeremy was telling you about is to get him, uh, for us from Whiteboard to start talking about him on Twitter and Facebook and really start getting the word out. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, tell you a little bit about Don. And um, if these work. So that's his last name, Don Corey. Uh, he's been on, uh, on Wall Street Journal, he's reporting there. He's regularly on CBS, correct, in uh, Boston area, that's where he's from, uh, and the Atlantic. Uh, he's interviewed, and he'll show you a couple of clips of the interviews from that. Uh, what I requested him to do today is to try to show you how he does some of the stuff, but he can't give you the secret sauce. So he's not going to tell you exactly how he does it, but he'll tell you some of the nonverbals and so on. Uh, this is when I met him. I mean, he basically came and said, in 2010, they had predicted 35 out of the 37 races correctly, and 36 and 37 went into recounts. Am I correct? Yeah, we're pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and some of them were, he used some of the examples of the predictions he made uh, two months before the actual elections, and nobody had any, was, no, none of the polls were even showing that the direction he was predicting. Uh, so it's interesting. So 2012 is going to be an interesting year. I don't know if he can repeat the 95% accuracy he had in 2010, uh, but he's pretty confident in 2014 he can repeat that. Uh, but let's see what happens. So what I want him to do today is to walk you through this, and you will have time to ask him questions. Uh, and feel free to do that. So this is my friend, Don Corey. And do you want to show the video? Or? Actually, I'll let you do it. Well, we have to, okay. You want me to do it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to show you these two videos. And I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Remember it. Don's going to come back and talk about it. Here we go. In times of great challenge in our country and around. That's what the American people have been doing in recent days with their extraordinary. The two leaders with me today will ensure that this is matched by a historic effort that extends beyond our. That's one video. Just keep that in mind. If you picked up on something, that was at regular speed. Here's the other one, probably from the same, uh, same time, correct? Same time. Yeah, same, same. Uh, obviously, we're just standing it up. Uh, but it will immediately give people uh, a means to comment. Okay, that was it. So that was it. I'm going to increase the program volume a little bit. And, well, here we go. Don't hear it. but it's more than just me. I decided about uh, eight months ago when I did come to give a presentation that I like this place so much and I like the energy that I want to move here with my family. And that's why we're here today to try and really build a buzz to, around Whitewater and, um, and, uh, and create, you know, create something pretty cool here. And we know there's some other things going on here and I want to thank some other people who have helped 
a great deal in making the reports that we're selling uh, possible. Um, obviously, Professor Basu and Professor uh, Chenamanami, right over there. Uh, Sarah Mary, who's been, where is Sarah? Yeah, who's been extremely helpful. Uh, Jeremy Homan, who was, spoke a few minutes ago. Uh, Tapan Shah, you're, you're out, out back there, he's helping us. Um, Henry, is Henry here? Henry's helped us quite a bit. Um, and over at the Innovation Center, Blackthorn, which, which is another company over there, has been tremendous in helping us and lending us um, some of their resources and help, in helping us move forward, as well as the Innovation Center, and also the students and staff at, uh, at the GBRC. So let's look at, start with some perceptions. Do people know who these people are? In 2010, there were two big news events. The Chilean mine disaster, okay, and the first one is uh, Sebastian Pinera, the president of Chile, <coughs> and then the, the other one was the BP oil spill in the Gulf, and that is uh, Tony Hayward, and he was the president of BP at the time. So keep these in mind as we go through this, and we're going to come back to these two gentlemen. Here, I just want to show you some of the predictions that we made in 2010. You can see here, this is one of our uh, more interesting ones. We were able to pick in, on the 10th of uh, October that the Democrat would win. And you can see from those bar graphs that the seven national polling firms that we compared ourselves to either had it as a, uh, a toss-up for green or a uh, leaning Republican. And we, were, we never switched, but up until the day before the election, no national firm suggested that the outcome would be what we had predicted. And we were able to do it three weeks ahead of time, based on the behavior of the candidates. And how we assume that people in the middle will react to the target effect brought on by the candidates. So we think that there are true believers on either side, Republican and Democrat, they're always going to vote one way. But it's those independents in the middle that swing based on this behavior. Here, this, is, uh, this looks at the polling data from 2010. There was a special election to replace Ted Kennedy in Massachusetts. Is anybody familiar with that, Scott Brown and Martha Coakley? If you look at here, we were able to predict when Scott Brown was 27%, Martha Coakley was at 58%, that Scott Brown would most likely be the winner of that election. Now, as you can see here, after we did that, there was a shift in this period. What happened in that period? There were three televised debates. And because it was such a high profile election, people actually paid attention, specifically independents, who were then influenced by, um, by their behavior. Now, Martha Copley went on to get reelected again as Attorney General, but no one pays attention to that race. So it's about party identification and not necessarily about the personality of the candidates. And so, she was able to continue on. I think she's won election, re-election twice since then. <coughs> so really, it's the candidates, too, but it's not the economy, it's not the issues. What we've identified is that in a high-profile race, people, we, we interview people coming out of debates, and we ask them, you know, who is the person that you're most, do you know who the person is that you're most likely to vote for? Absolutely. Okay, what are the three issues that you agree with that person on? No one can give us more than one if they're lucky. But they can certainly tell you who they're going to vote for and how they feel about that candidate. And that is the driver of what makes people move one way or the other. So we're going to look at these three areas, then we're going to go and get into a couple of our predictions, and then we'll open up to questions. Is that fair? So for, let's, let's look at appearance. Does anyone know this? who that is? Anybody? Elliot Spitzer, the governor of New York. That's the day he has to resign because of an extramarital affair, if you want to call it that, that he had. Um, how choreographed do you think that setup is? Not very? Very? Anybody? I know some people in the room have seen this before. Oh, the whole thing? Very choreographed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's very choreographed. Right down to the fact that she has a pearl necklace, the wife has a pearl necklace on, she's got that light blue <coughs> outfit. The dark blue in the back for trust, the striped tie to show deference to her and to the to the pop, to the to the public and voting uh, the people who are voting. They're thinking about their rehabilitation as they're going down. So let's pretend that you're from a neighboring state and you have to resign for a fairly similar reason. Do you think that the same setup is going to happen? 
right? Because it's about the imagery that gives you the message, not the words. Now, does anyone know what a community organizer looks like? Anyone? Come on, somebody. Yes, Mary, what's a community organizer? A community organizer is someone who um, gets their community together for a common cause. Can you think of a famous example of a community organizer? Barack Obama. Right, there you go. <coughs> you know what a president looks like? That's what a president looks like. So after, well, while he was a community organizer and the people were able to um, get a hold of him and train him, you can see that he will never, I doubt you'll ever see him wear the gray on gray tie shirt combo or the untailored uh, jacket. But you will see he'll wear a tailored blue suit more often than not. And the tie is what delivers the message. And it's the tie that says, okay, this is the message that they are trying to portray to the public. And we, if anybody wants to talk about the ties, we've got, uh, afterwards, we've got uh, another 10 slides on ties that can prove our point. Here, most of the seminal research was done from the 50s to the 70s on nonverbal behavior, so there's not a whole lot of women in the workplace or in terms of uh, politics. But what we have found is that women who have made it to the U.S. Senate, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, often uh, are the best at portraying their nonverbal behavior. And so if we look here, you can see, does anybody notice anything interesting about all these women who are U.S. Senators or have been U.S. Senators? Anything? I'm going to start asking. Okay, yes. Uh, short hair. Shorter hair. Specifically, is there anything else about their hair? Anything else? It's not in their face, right? Their, 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 um, their foreheads. Matt? Uh, there. Yeah. Uh, their neck. Their neck, yeah, their neck is free as well, right? But notice something else. Their outfit is a full color, right? Very much like the ties for the male politicians. Now, they might have a blouse underneath. And so that's important in terms of the, the image that you're trying to portray. So let's, let's take an example of uh, the other night there was a debate between um, uh, Tammy and Tommy. How should Tammy have, should she have worn a red or a blue blouse? Or jacket? And maybe a white blouse with a collar, do you think? Would that make sense? So sometimes people do some research, and I'm not saying her, but perhaps the people around her, the, she wore the black, right? And then the blue blouse. That, to me, would have been a mistake. Because it comes across as a little too, um, and by the way, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, I'm a Canadian, so I will insult both sides before the end of it. So if you feel a little left out, don't worry, I'll get to you soon. Um, but the idea with her hair, right, covering her forehead and her, uh, that black outfit probably didn't work. And the other thing, and you can't see this in the, in the still picture, but her necklace, her pearl necklace really um, was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Mary? Distracting. Uh, because it was coming up against the blouse so often. So now let's look at, um, let's take, take a look at some of the environmental things that people are able to do. So they're able to place themselves in a certain environment which allows them to give the best possible image. And when they're comparing themselves to other candidates, they can mess around with the environment a little bit. And that'll be, that'll be the next slide. But for here, you see George Bush, and in the background you see pictures of his family. Right? And you see the gold drapes for prestige. See the same thing with Barack Obama. In fact, every president in the television age is going to have that. Except for one, during a short period of time in his presidency. Who would that be? Who didn't have, instead of having pictures behind his family, a picture of his family behind him, he had busts of ex-presidents and books and one picture. Anybody have an idea? Christian Yeo does. Bill Clinton, because at the time, if he had all these pictures of his family behind him, then that would not have become a, a transparent message, right? So it, would, it wouldn't have been the message that they wanted to deliver. People would be uncomfortable. They wouldn't know why they were uncomfortable, but they would be uncomfortable about it. And again, he's wearing that striped tie, and there's reasons for that, and I, I can answer that afterwards. But yes, at, when those other guys had the same issue, they were wearing that striped tie as well. Does anybody know something interesting about this 
photo. So what we would say is it's perfectly ethnically weighted behind them. And you'll find that in these national campaigns, when they appear, suddenly everybody behind them will be perfectly ethnically weighted to the voting populace. Is that fair? And so there's X's that say, you know, you go to number two with the X, and you go to number 23 with the X. And so everybody's set up that way. So here, I'm going to play you, and this is another environmental thing. I'm going to play you four slides of Bill Clinton with his theme song. And then I'm going to show you four more slides with a different song. And tell me if that changes the imagery in your head, OK? Fair enough? Does that change things in your head? A little bit? Okay. So now let's look at some of the body language, okay, in, in terms of how they actually present themselves, how they display themselves when they're delivering a message. If we look here, there are seven messages that are communicated non-verbally, and what you want to communicate more of is credibility and openness, and less of the superiority, disinterest, uh, insecurity, defensiveness, or deceit. Okay? So let's look at two candidates here, right? You've got a Republican, Scott Brown, a Democrat, um, Barack Obama. And you see that they're delivering their message in the same, using the same gesture. So if you look at the top one, that's that from the heart, you know, gesture you can do with one hand or two. And so they'll often, Scott Brown was a master in 2010, they would attack him on women's issues, and he would say, I have a wife and three daughters at home. How dare you know, and they're in the audience, and, you know, that rather than getting back and, and pointing the finger because that creates a, an escalation rather than bringing it in and moving it on to, um, to issues over character. The next one, this one is considered authoritative but not aggressive. So instead of pointing your finger to somebody, if you do this, it comes across as more credible rather than creating some kind of emotional disturbance. The next is this holding the spirit. You'll see the president use this a lot. Instead of touching their hands, which can make people feel uncomfortable, they'll often hold the sphere if they're talking about a subject. So every time they, they, they're not doing a one, two, three, or something else, they're going to come back to here rather than here, right, or here. Which gives you a, a, a sense that they're more confident, calm, and um, worthwhile of your, of, your, uh, of your vote. Then the next one is this chopping gesture, which many of them use. But what you want to know is that when you do a chop or a slice, you want to wait until you've built some kind of rapport with the audience that you're, that you're working with. Bill Clinton was very good at, he would choreograph every one of his answers and it would come from his body to, um, to, to the chop at the end. And then if you look at someone like Governor Huntsman, in, um, a Republican from Utah, what he would do is throughout the debate, instead of doing it for each answer, he would start every answer here, and then here, and then here, and at the end, he would do his chopping, which was very powerful as well. So the idea was using this choreographing to either answer one question or multiple, multiple um, questions. So let's look at some different standing postures you might see. Ooh. Here. This is very much a high confidence stance, right? Here would, would, is very much a vulnerable stance. And so you'll see even powerful people on a stage will have an instinct to automatically cover. The ones that know better will pull it back and put it behind their, their stuff. But the ones that don't will often do this, right? Here, what I want you to notice here is the foot. If you're in a, in a situation where you're having a conversation with somebody and their foot is pointed somewhere else and not both feet at you, that would mean that they're probably not interested, and their foot is probably pointed at the door or to somebody else. But if you're not interested, look at your own feet. 
and see where, they're, where, where that's pointed. And if you know that it's an important person to speak with, you want to square back to them or somehow get yourself out of there. The next one, and these are all indicators. They're not for sure things, right? Is that when the thumbs protrude from the back pocket, you'll find that someone is having a conversation and agreeing with you on a subject that they feel that they have a superior uh, opinion about that they don't necessarily want to get into that with you. And then the next, if someone has their hands in the pockets, it would indicate they just don't want to don't want to be there right now. So let's pretend that the president elect 2008, and you're supposed to be his bulldog, and you've got to stand beside him at a press conference. How are you going to stand? If you're going to be his protector. Which one of these things are you going to pick? Top left, right. Now you see Rahm Emanuel, president, current president, or uh, mayor of of uh, Chicago, and all the other members of the cabinet are sitting there covering themselves, but yet he's sitting here like this. And obviously he's, he's done that on purpose, and his, that's his role. Now let's look at some of the sitting postures. Here, this is very much a trained one, where people have their legs crossed, their hand over their hand, and you know, the, the head tilted. When someone has their head tilted, it would indicate that they're open to suggestion because they're tilted, they're opening their neck to you. The next one is this slouching behavior would say, I kind of own this place, you know, <laughs> I'm the man, or, or, or the woman, or, but it's not something that really is, uh, uh, endears you to, to your uh, conversation partner. The next is if you see somebody with their hands on their, on their lap, it would indicate that they're ready to leave. It's that starter position. They're really trying. They're they're trying to hold themselves back, maybe, but they just don't want to be there. They're uncomfortable in that situation. This one, when you've got that locked in, it would indicate that they have a lot. Their behavior, or sorry, their attitude about something is locked in. So you've got to open them up before you can get them to actually uh, be open to suggestion. Now I said they're all indicators. This one is probably the most reliable of all uh, of all things. And that's when someone scratches their neck or puts their elbow up. That is, they're, they're putting their elbow up to protect their, um, uh, protect themselves emotionally. Even if they have the itch, it really is to get that, to get the elbow to protect themselves, uh, themselves emotionally. So if you're having a conversation and you're asking someone some pointed questions, you'll find that um, they'll get this up here and they're, they're going to start to feel very emotional. The next is um, this. How many women like this? Anybody? <laughs> Here's a trick for you. When the cobra comes up, if you stand up, the cobra will come down. And then you sit down, it comes back up. Um, and then you sit down and up and down. And now you're in control. You're like Geppetto, the puppet master of their body. So let's look at, here's the Kennedy-Nixon debate from 1960. Are people familiar with that? You can see Kennedy with that. Um, quiet, sort of comfortable pose that we talked about. And then Nixon with his hands on his lap, ready to go. And he was just uncomfortable. Everybody knows he was uncomfortable. He just didn't want to be there. But this is Deval Patrick. He's the current governor of Massachusetts. This guy is one of the best. He's probably better than the president in terms of his, um, his ability to communicate non-verbally. But he's using the same seating behavior. And then again, here's the president on the view. Right, doing the same thing. Now, here's something that's interesting about men and women. Men, almost all men, will cross their legs the same direction every time. Women will cross their legs in the direction of their interest. Right. So you can see on both sides are kind of coming out. Town hall debates can be very interesting for candidates who understand nonverbal behavior, and it can, it can also be very detrimental to candidates who don't understand it. And that's what happened in 92 to, to George Bush. Um, Bill Clinton was well trained and well versed in this stuff, and, and he was not. But let's look at some of the uh, things that they'll use, some of the techniques. So, for example, you can see the president where he's got his hand over his hand and his foot on the floor, right? <clears throat> so look at Bill Clinton. Same thing. Same guy trained them both. His name is Michael Sheen. You can check him out on the internet. Um, 
If you look at, here's a town hall from 1994. This is Ted Kennedy and uh, Mitt Romney. Now look at how Mitt Romney is seated there. And Ted Kennedy's got his foot on the floor, hand over hand, and there's the camera. Now he's able to communicate that he's the adult in the room without ever having to say it. And Mitt Romney's communicating that he's the little boy in the room without even realizing it. <laughs> and here's a better picture of the two of them. Even here, you can see the, the difference, but although Ted Kennedy is holding his, even the best sometimes mess up. I wouldn't have held my hand like that. But he certainly looks better than, than Mitt Romney in this situation. And then I just talked quick about the Wisconsin debates. In 2010, we were able to predict that one early as well. And this one we were able, this is the one that got me in trouble, the last presentation I made in this room, when I said that um, uh, the governor would, uh, would fight back the recall, and we were able to make that prediction in February. When, in fact, Tom Barrett at that time, although he hadn't had the nomination, the polls were suggesting he was five points behind, and I needed security to get me off campus that night. <laughs> Um, so remember we talked about perception as reality and we talked about the, um, uh, the BP oil spill and the miners in Chile. So let's take another look at that. This is Sebastian Pinera. He is the uh, president of Chile. He it shows up to the site. They don't know if the miners are alive. right? He's got a, a gray tie on and a suit on and buttoned up and somber face and he's, you know, they don't know. They find out now I want you to notice a couple things about this picture. Can everybody see that fairly clear? I know it's kind of tough. The, um, he's wearing a shirt, a blue, light blue shirt, without his jacket on, so he has his sleeves rolled up, which is important, because it shows that you're, you know, you're working with people. And he's also got the people around him who are perfectly ethnically weighted to the voting populace. Chile, and he's got that symbolic thing, that piece of paper that was sent up from, by the miners. Then you see him, giving an update about the miners, and his, hand, you know, his hands are open, he's showing his palms, very Christ-like. And then um, at the end, you see him with this light blue hope tie, and the miners are all smiling and heading off into the future. Now let's contrast this with the BP spill. Now this is Tony Hayward, the president of BP, and the guy who ran the rig where people died, okay? And so they're sitting there with this high confidence stance two or three days after the event, laughing and joking. It's probably not the image that BP wants to communicate to the rest of the world, especially the people in the US. Here you see him in a, uh, a uh, press conference doing this, right? It's emotionally a little too tough for him. He's got nobody around him, which he should have either people from BP or people from the Gulf or something and he's created too much of a barrier between him and the press. And again here, and you can contrast each of these with the above, right? Here he's got the, the sleeves rolled down, and he's, like he's trying to say, you know, he's trying to give a confidence thing that we're gonna clean this thing up. I'm not feeling confident about a guy showing vulnerability, consciously or unconsciously. And then the next thing, at the end of the day, he gets booed out of this congressional testimony. Now, I would suggest that the perception Right, of both of these would be dra dramatically <coughs> different, the perceived outcome, if the teams had switched. So if Sebastian Pinera was down here, they'd say, well, they're cleaning it up, they put 20 billion into the fund, and he would know how to communicate that. And if Tony Hayward had been on the top, they would have said, well, the miners were on the ground too long, and he was unable to communicate the, the message in the right way. And so the idea is that perception is important, and being able to, to communicate with the perception so let's go back to these videos again uh, that Dr. Basu had uh, showed us. And this time I want you to watch for Bill Clinton going and doing the, you know, that instinctual thing to cover and know to go back. George Bush is going to cover, but what's going to happen is someone is going to indicate to him, because they have minders in the audience, that he should take his hands up. And so he's going to like, I don't know what he's watching. <laughs> and then he's going to nod thank you to the person. So watch this. Now times, uh, great challenge. In our country, and around. it's what the American people have been doing in recent days with their extraordinary. The two leaders with me today will ensure that this is matched by a historic effort that extends beyond our. Now, Bill Clinton is somebody we, we, we 
we would put, we're able to classify everybody into four different categories, and, but Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan, we just kind of put in a, in a category of their own. And they understand this stuff better than anybody else. He knows what he wants out of this, um, this situation. He sees that the president's covered. He wants um, George Bush to cover because he wants to look the best. Now, he's going to be stone-faced. At the very end, you're going to see this little what's called duping the light. When he, when he goes up like this, and it's not going to work, he's going to pop up like a blowfish to try and get George Bush, and then he'll nudge him. And he'll, um, George Bush will cover, and Bill Clinton will see it. Just a, a little <laughs> tiny smile. Uh, obviously, we're just standing it up, uh, but it will immediately give people uh, a means to come. <laughs> okay, so that's, I had to show you all that so I can show you some of our predictions. So what we're going to, what we decide, instead of showing all the predictions, is we're going to show the three most interesting ones, and then if anyone has any, uh, wants to bring up any of the other races this year that are happening in the gubernatorial races, we'll be happy to discuss it and, and share with you our prediction. So the first one is this. This will be our prediction for the presidency. No. No, that's yeah. No, that's okay. What's that? Well, I would say it's going to be, it's going to be well, any way that Romney goes there, it's going to be difficult. But if we, if we look here, and this is from May 13th of 2012, so I'm going to play some words. Now, you have said in the past that he has excellent body rap, which is a lie. Um, he's just calm, cool, collected. He has a, the vocal pitch and tone that are even. Uh, you know, we've made our prediction for this year. We believe he'll probably uh, be the victor. So we're able to make our predictions that far in advance. You know, this was May 13th of this year. We actually made our prediction in January, but this is the first time we did it on TV was then. Because we look to see how they're actually going to match up when they come together. Right? And so that's why we're able to make it that early. And say that the, the, the stark difference between the two is so much that there's no way we believe that Mitt Romney can, uh, can pull it off. But he pop, there is a possibility, and we, we reserve the right to change our predictions based on debate performances when they do come together. So that's the presidential. Now I want to talk about the Senate race in Massachusetts, because this is, this is kind of, uh, can be a little bit funny. But this was us, this was me last year, at the end of September of last year, Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown, who were both the two top candidates, had both announced. Yeah. Want to make a prediction on the presidential race right now, Tom? I'm going to make a prediction on the on uh, the the governor. No, sorry, the um, the Senate race. The, no, I'm, oh, Senate race. I can make that. Scott Brown. You're that confident just based on based on the candidates that he's running against right. that are going up and get announced. Right. Now another candidate could come out of the fold. Yeah. Today is September 30th. Yeah. Yeah. All right. If you got John Nugget, if you're right, boy, you're going to create shockwaves. Hey. That, now, do you see how confident I was in saying that? Okay. So then they had a debate a week and a half ago. And I went back on and talked about it. Okay. Okay. But, but, but generally, generally, I, I, she won. In our scoring system, she won. And I was very surprised by that. Wow. She worked very hard. Yeah, so she's been working on her body language, and he maybe didn't prepare as well as he might have? Uh, absolutely, yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So now, uh, just to wrap it up here, yeah. Don, can he recover from that in your view? I think he can. Yeah. Um, I think last night he could have, you know, those debate, the, sorry, those polls that came out last week, yeah. I didn't put much into them. I had yeah. showing her moving ahead. Showing her moving ahead. As far as I was concerned, as of last night, he was ahead. Yeah. Um, after last night, I would give her the edge. Yeah. And, oh, and in the next few debates, if he can uh, pull it out, we'll let you yeah. know. Well, we'll look forward to having you back to look at some of those forthcoming debates, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, thanks, John. So, I, we changed our prediction based on that debate performance to her. Now, they had another debate last night, and we changed it back again. <laughs> so, I don't have the video for that because we haven't, we haven't been on to discuss it yet, but Certainly, I, I would suggest now that it's his again. But what had to happen last night was not only did he have to win, but she had to lose. And that's what happened. She lost and he won. Kind of like um, the other night, I think um, Tommy tried to lose, but she wouldn't let him. Would be my, uh, what, I, what I felt about that, that debate. Now the other, what I, what I think is the most interesting race that we're looking at right now, is a Vermont governor's race. Now, the last poll 
suggested that the, the Democratic incumbent had a 60% chance of re-election and that his Republican challenger had about a 27% chance of re-election, or of election, of, of, of getting elected. I'm not sure how close it's going to come, but I can, I can guarantee you that this is going to close up. And I would not be surprised if the, uh, if the Republican won the election. So if you want to tweet about that, and you can help to uh, move that one along, it's DTGov is the, is the, um, uh, the hashtag. But that one is, um, we're watching very closely, and we feel that the Republican will most likely um, close that gap and walk away with it. Uh, no, that should, oh, no, that's not, okay, that's, okay, the questions. Any questions? Yes. With like the Obama speech questionnaire, it's like Bill Clinton and Bush next to him. Yeah. How come they both have the striped ties when he's talking? Well, it's interesting. So many things. No, 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 no. It's interesting, and and that's something we talk about in our in our tie thing, which is a long, long one. I didn't want to get into that too much into the presentation. None of you had. So the tie, when you have those three presidents together, the two ex presidents are going to wear the striped ties to show deference to the current president. And you'll see Joe Biden will wear a straight tie in the State of the Union, John Boehner won't, and the president will wear a solid tie. But the idea is to show deference to, and now you'll also find the president now will wear a lot of strike ties during the election, and then right after the election he'll go back to the solid at the end to, to uh, elevate his, his image. Is that? Yeah, I kind of get it. Yeah. Yes? Do you have a website as so where we can learn more about what are you we do. We're, 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 um, did you want to take that, Tab? Tabs? No. Did you want to take that question? We're rebuilding it right now, so it should be out by the end of the week. It's donpori.com. Don? Don. D-O-N-Corey.com. If anybody needs a mic to ask a question, just let us know if we're ready to. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, I read quite a long time ago about physical attractiveness of mm -hmm. candidates, and that's one of the reasons I thought that Romney would get the edge in his election, um, mm -hmm. you know, with his peers, do you use that in some of yours? Is that part of your secret sauce? Well, I think if someone is grotesque, <laughs> comparatively, comparatively speaking, um, sure. I mean, and I shouldn't say grotesque. That's not the right word. I would say that if it depends who you're comparing yourself to, right? So, like, looks wise, I think they're probably equal. Um, so he's not going to get too much of an advantage there, and. We look at, like for example, we're, we predicted the, the guy in Vermont to win last time because he was better than the other guy. But he's not better than this guy. Do you know what I mean? Okay. And so it's who's better than who. And Obama certainly outperformed. Like I said, I'll, I'll uh, insult everybody. Any other? Yes? How did you develop these strategies? Well, I, I, I married an American, and I had a couple of years before I could move here um, that I could just sit in front of uh, C-SPAN and develop. But no, the truth is I, <laughs> I read a book where, in a study where I found that they were able to identify that people were more likely to get venture capital funding based on their nonverbal behavior rather than uh, what was the, the nature of the presentation. And so what I thought was, hey, you know what? I bet you that there's the same kind of target effect on voters. And so we, over uh, watching you know, almost 300 debates, we were able to develop um, this system looking for those markers and we found them. Yes, Aaron. When your uh, methods uh, do fail, yes. um, are there particular uh, features or um, things that you would point to that say, uh, these confound my metrics or, or these <coughs> That's an interesting question. Um, Sorry. To which I do have an answer, but I, it's one I, I don't want to, you know. Let's put it this way the ones that we get wrong, both that we got wrong in 2010 went into um, recounts. So it was, it was fairly close. So it was really a flip of the point. And that's why we're talking more about, now we're talking, instead of uh, predicting black and white, we're predicting with the help of Professor Chairman of the Army, that right? Uh, sorry. <laughs> predicting trends rather than win or loss. Win or loss. <laughs> yes? Does the level of government in which the candidates are running for make a difference? 
Absolutely. Uh, it's very, um, that, that's a great question. And, and we found that we're, in terms of the gubernatorial and the presidential, we're very, uh, we're very reliable. Uh, not so much in the down ballot races. But it's, it's, it's becoming more reliable in the down ballot races. To, and there's things that people can do in down ballot races to make it more reliable. Right, there are techniques that they can use. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she said, well, just the Tammy Tommy um, thing. She felt that it was fairly even. And I would suggest it was fairly even, but you want. And, you know, if we look at it. Pardon me? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the imaging and everything else, she could have done some things like that. In the back, and I'll come. Pretty much. There's only one that we shifted in 2010 from our original um, prediction that was Hawaii. Both candidates completely changed in terms of their behavior. Nothing. What we found is that, um, for example, in, um, in let's say Utah in 2010, you had Gary Herbert, who was the um, Republican incumbent. And you had uh, Peter Caron, who was the, the Democrat. Their Democrats aren't, um, and it's the same thing in Massachusetts, right? The Democrats are the reverse, sorry, in Massachusetts, where the Democrats will attract the, the, the better candidates and the Republicans won't. So what I would suggest is that if that, when that reverses, that's when you have your surprise elections, right? And so that's what we believe is happening in Vermont. Because normally the better candidate will go with the, the party that's perceived to be the state party. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yeah. OK. If you can't afford Michael Sheen, for example, to teach you work, would you go to learn these techniques? You know, Me? Coaching them. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of consulting fee? <laughs> well, we can talk about that after that's something, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes, Che. Is it, is it possible that you took off probably Bob Wayne and Thompson, for example, and see if you say a candidate that is losing, is it possible to teach them these techniques and then make them appealing to the population and make them win? By who who, who were you talking about? For example, Bob Wayne and Thompson, and probably yeah. mistake she made during the debate. Is there, is there a way that you can probably teach these candidates <coughs> these mistakes that they're making and then make them win? Well, here's the thing is what we have, there, there are two areas that we look at what we categorize them, what we call negative and positive. The positives are very easy to train into somebody. The negatives are, take a much longer time to train out. And so even if you, if you train someone on, those, on the positive behaviors, the negative behaviors will leak. And so people, more women than men will be uncomfortable with someone who's been trained on the positives but the negatives have not been trained out. So the positives, I can train you in three hours. The negatives, three years. And that's why we're able to predict so early, because it's so hard to predict the, in, in, in one cycle to, to, to uh, train out the negatives. Don, can I request you to do two things? Yes, sir. I would like you to talk to them about the hands. OK, which part? The frustration and some of that. OK. OK, and also then expand it to some of your other, other areas, like entrepreneurs and so on, how, how this applies to that too? Well, it applies in, in terms of business. When you're talking to somebody, um, when you're in sales, if you don't know these things where you can actually communicate yourself or read where someone else is and you're relying on a text or a talk track, you could be in trouble at the end of the day. But if you're able to read people, then you know where they are and you know how to move forward. Um, and, and, and move that forward. We've actually developed a thing called Thread, which allows people to know where they are in a sales cycle with their, with their prospect 
and, um, and actually move it through the thread to be able to get to the proper, at the end of the D, the decision that they're looking for. Is that? And the hands, what do you mean? The hands, the way they're holding their hands, if you can give one or two things, and also maybe show them the handshake. And the okay, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can, do you want me to show them? No, you can just show them this. Okay. So the hand, I mean, you don't want to touch your hands. So if you can, you know, like we talked about this holding the spear or fingers, you know, if you have to put it together, just the tips of your fingers, right? Or put your um, hands behind your back, not in front of you, right? Because this, this is, you can't really read somebody. They're able to kind of be a chameleon, but here you know that they're not feeling, you know, tremendously uh, happy. Now, can I, can I? Bill, can you help me for a second? Yeah, we're going to pretend that Bill is Vladimir Putin. I think this is the example, right? And it's a summit in 2008, I think. Yeah, they had the summit, or 2006, Russia had this G20 summit. All the world leaders are coming in the golf carts. The world's press is here, and they've got to shake hands with him and go up the, sta up, up the stairs to the meeting. So they come in. Now, the thing is, you want the back of your hand to show, because it shows that you're the one who's in control. So he's got every one of the world leaders. He's got it set up. There's no way they can do it. The last two guys to come in are Tony Blair and George Bush. Tony Blair comes in and does that, right? George Bush comes in and does this, turns him around, and guides him up the stairs. And that's another one. If you're guided by somebody else, that also shows that the guider is the one who's in control. And I wish I had, thanks, Bill. I wish I could show you more pictures of that. There's some exa good examples of that. But no, yes. I, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on negatives, a few more of those negatives, mm. of what those include, because you said they're hard to take out. And also, Mitt Romney is very unpopular with women. I was wondering if that's people. Well, that has a lot to do with it, because um, it's that lack of transparency and what leaks from him, right? And so you'll find that when he's trying to say something and he's trying to act like this is, this is what he believes, it, it leaks out in terms of some rapid jerkiness or his head movements. His body is fighting him, and you know unconsciously women will pick up on him more than men will. Like at, at a two to one rate, it causes a lot of problems in relationships because. <laughs> yeah. so, any other? Does that answer your question? Uh, more negative. Well, that rapid jerkiness. I'll give okay. you that one, and okay. um, well, this. You know, okay. especially a town hall debate where people are putting their they, they're standing there and their, their hands are in their pocket or they're doing this or Mitt Romney. You know, or to speed her up like that, we'll score them negatively on those instinctual behaviors rather than the, the trained ones. I saw it. Yes, ma'am. Why is it easy to make positive things? Mm -hmm. What are the reasons? Well, I think the, po the positives, the positives are more conscious, the negatives are more unconscious. And so they're just more who you are, and they just leak. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. Talk about men. Yeah. Same thing. Well, they'll look, well, men will, okay, for men it's this, this is the big one. Women will do this too, but when women are feeling most vulnerable, it will be this. Okay. Right? So it's covering the, the most. <laughs> <laughs> That's always one I have a hard time with. Yeah. <laughs> Not much. If you want a great woman to watch, it's Christine Gregoire. She's the governor of um, Washington State right now. I think she's the best. And if you watch her debates with Dino Rossi um, and model her, she's, she does all the same things and she does them very well. And she does this so well. All right, and delivers it in a way that's just, yeah, she's the best. Yes, sir. Is it possible to totally eliminate? Absolutely. Yeah. It takes, it takes longer. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, you can you can eliminate it. Any other? Yes, Aaron. Would you say that most of this is uh, in context that, uh, for instance, Mitt Romney would come across as being more comfortable in a business transaction or dealing with the Olympics or something? Well, and it's running for president that's doing this? We have... You know, two of the categories that we categorize people in are what's called a leader and one is called an achiever. 
the leader body language, it usually gets more votes. The achiever body language gets more uh, money invested in. And so the achievers are usually better in business, uh, but probably would have a hard time getting more votes as a leader. Look at Donald Trump. You know, he's way off on the achiever side, but I doubt he'd get many votes, right, on that side. From women, anyway. All right. Any other? Yeah, oh, okay. can, you, can you talk about the moderates again? About, because I, I, I want to make sure that people understand that you're talking about the moderates swaying the vote, and yeah. also the media, with all the new media that's pushing out these, you're getting more and more accurate. That's right, we're getting more accurate because moderates can see it's no longer you know the evening news, these static images on the evening news. People are able to see video and uh, um, uh, examples of these candidates in debate situations or in other situations more and more when they want to see it because of this social media. And that's becoming more and more prevalent and so we're able to be more and more accurate. In fact, it'll go further and further down ballot as people become more aware of social media and how it gets out there. Does that? What's that? Somebody had a question. Oh, yeah. yes sir. Uh, who's we? Did you prefer to we? A small team that we have a team. Okay. Yeah, we have a team. And we even have children that we employ. No, I, I'm being serious because children are less jaded, and so we get them to look at certain things um, to help us make our judgments. Yeah. A lot of people with disabilities, like uh, John McCain, his yeah. slouch, yeah. you want to call it, how would that affect your calculation? Uh, John McCain's a hero, but it's still going to go negative against him. I mean, Tom Barrett, his hands, I know the story about his hands. I think it's a great story. But unfortunately, his hands, we, we, we have to score him negative on some of his hand gestures because of that. And if there aren't many questions, I mean, I'm happy to stay afterwards um, if anyone has any questions. And do we want to close it off now, Chotan? Uh, I don't know. Any, any last minute questions? You didn't get torn any. No, I know. I'm, I'm happy. Oh, somebody, where, where? There's a question over here? Where? All the way. Oh, sorry, man. Sorry. Right. How long have you been doing this? 10 years. Yeah. How long did it take you to start getting your formulas together to where you felt confident in like, putting predictions out there? Four or five years. Yeah, it was 2010 before we started going, you know, before the actual election day. So I would say, yeah. Probably five years, so about seven years in total, I guess. Yeah. If that makes. 2004, I think, is the year we started. <coughs> yes? Do you do this for Canadian elections as well? I do. <laughs> yeah. And now, here's something. Are you Canadian? No. Are you familiar with Canadian elections? <laughs> well, here's an interesting thing that. Well, no, but here's, no, but it's, it's funny that you say that because there's two governing parties that have always been the governing parties in Canada. It's the Liberals and the Conservatives. They're, and as you know, the most conservative Canadian politician would be considered a moderate Democrat, apparently. But there's a third party called the New Democratic Party, and they're always the third party. And in the last election, uh, during the debates, because all three participated, I, just, I didn't even look at him. I scored the two top ones knowing which one was going to win. Uh, but working with Americans, they're looking at all three and they say, well, wait a second, look at this third party guy. And I'm like, well, it's just the history of Canada. And, and so I was a little jaded there and I was wrong. That guy actually, for the first time in history, became the, the opposition. He got second place. Yes? What ties should I wear to a job interview? Depends. Are you interviewing with a man, a woman, older, younger? All, all you know. But the two ties, you know, uh, maroon is going to give you credibility, and that kind of darker blue is going to give you trust and integrity. You can't go wrong with those. Any other? Yes. The full suit. Yeah, sorry, I, we've got, uh, we, we, we try to close down the amount of, um, but we have examples of that. But yes, the full suit. Okay, and the colors matter. The colors matter. So it's the full suit for a woman and the, and the tie for the men. And so, for example, when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama came out after he secured the nomination, 
her full suit matched his tie, right? When President Bush and President Obama met for the first time after the election, they both had the exact same tie, right? And the reason for that is to indicate to the world that hey, we're on the same page. And so when two people are wearing the same colors and the same outfit, it's more persuasive. So a lot of sales people will do that. Yes, sir? Do you vote in elections? I can. Yeah. Unless I vote in an exit poll on the other side of the polls. But I try to influence my wife, but that's not so, <laughs> not so great. But no, I can't. I'm, I'm unable to vote. Yes, sir? I, I wonder how widely you've tried to apply um, these rules, like the, the color rules, gesture rules, and if things change in other cultures, like do colors change in the Orient, or? There are certain things that are culture specific and certain things that aren't. We've been right um, in, in predicting um, the election win in England, and we were correct in predicting the trend in Greece. So we're looking at Western nations that are democracies. It's more difficult. I mean, Saddam Hussein obviously had very good body language. He got 99% of the vote every time. Uh, you know, it's a study in contrast, I guess. Any other? Yes. Ninety-five percent, two months out. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I, you know, I don't like to. You know, uh, uh, claim rise. Was it rise or something? I don't know. But no, I, I would say that both that the both the ones we, that we got wrong went into uh, recounts, and they found ballots in basements. Could be, but but if you take everything into consideration. <coughs> Sometimes, yeah. No, thank you. Any other? We'll take two more questions. Yes, sir. So after all this, what do you think of politics in general? Just in what? Like you can't have much respect for it. You know? Oh, sure it I do. Seems like a, it seems like a game. I have huge respect for the people that actually prepare to win, and I don't have a like. I mean, here, Mitt Romney had a great debate performance in Florida in late January, early February. And because he had worked with this guy, um, Brett, uh, what can I think of his last name? He was the guy who was the Liberty University debate coach. And they beat Harvard. I mean, these guys are the best debaters in the world. And because the story got out that he had coached him, he fired him. And then his, his performance went back up. I think if had he stuck with Brett O'Donnell, was the guy's name, if he had stuck with Brett O'Donnell um, between then and now, he might have a shot. But yeah, no, I look at it on that side. I look at the, you know, how hard people work. Yeah, I meant more like, you know, when it comes down to the like, issues and things mm. are important, it seems you almost rule that out. I don't even listen to the issues. <laughs> right. That's what I mean. Yeah, I don't know. what. I don't even know what a Republican or a Democrat really stands for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, that's what it is all about. Absolutely. It is. Well, no, yes and no. <laughs> That's one more. Yes, Gary. So you're saying the words don't make, don't make any difference? So if somebody, somebody says something stupid? Well, I think really stupid, right, is going to cause a problem. <laughs> like anything, but, but uh, I would say it has to be really stupid. But look at Todd Aiken. I mean, he's still he's going to win that race in Missouri. That confounds me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll stay after for any qu any uh, questions, but I know people probably want to get out too. So, so before you guys take off, uh, let me make two, three quick uh, things. One is there's a sign-up sheet outside that you guys can sign for your classes. We'll make sure your, your faculty get it. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is I've been trying with Don for going on to seven months now. Yeah. Seven, eight months. And uh, he's very open to you approaching him, and talking to him, and learning more about the stuff. Um, he held back on a few things I know because he can't give that away. It's part of the scoring stuff. It's his bread and butter. So uh, if you have some very specific questions, you can ask him. The only thing he won't give you is dating advice, correct? 
Yeah. Well, so, can I tell them the story? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess going to tell you a story. No, but I was home at Christmas, and this guy says to me, um, you know, I want to invest in you, and I want to, um, I want you to come to Florida and do um, um, dating tips for geriatric widows and widowers. And he said, I can make you all kinds of my sex. Couldn't do it. But I'm sure the market is there. So if anybody wants to take up on that, you can probably make a lot of them. So he, yeah, he gets strange offers like that. My goal is uh, that uh, Pawan, where's, where's Pawan? Uh, uh, Pawan and I and this, some, of, some of the faculty, we are actually doing research to see if his, uh, uh, basically his algorithm works. So we're trying to validate that because we like much more from the research side. We're not as interested in the political side of things. We're business faculty, but uh, we have background in statistics and quantitative analysis. So that's what we're interested in. But in the meantime, while we're interacting with him, we started figuring out that it would be pretty cool to start having Don to move here from his ability. So I've been trying to sell him on white water. And uh, he's actually been bringing his family here. Yeah, we had to work at a here. And uh, he's been spending, like this time, you're we here for almost two weeks. Yeah. And uh, we work out of the Innovation Center. Uh, more and more students have been to work on projects that are interesting. If this stuff interests you, I know Don has some people working with them already. And if you're looking for more people down the line, our hope is to get in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's give a big round of applause here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if you could do whatever, Jeremy, I don't even know how this, I don't even know how the social media stuff works. But this I can, apparently is very powerful. So if you could tweet something, that would be awesome. Thank you. Well, you guys understand it. Just. Send him a tweet if you have a question or you want, if you think of something later, you have a question, ask him a question. Um, he can give you some advice. He, he's very interactive on Twitter. So you guys know how that works. I don't have to explain it to you like your five-year-olds like that. So thanks a lot for coming. <laughs>